Section 10. A Hymn of Hate. Of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The troops continue in excellent spirits. Extract from Official Dispatch. To appreciate properly from the Army's point of view the humor of this story, it must always be remembered that the regiment concerned is an English one, entirely and emphatically English, and indeed almost entirely East End Cockney. It is true that the British Army on active service has a sense of humor peculiarly its own, and respectable citizens have been known, when jests were retailed with the greatest gusto by soldier raconteurs, to shudder and fail utterly to understand that there could be any humor in a tale so mixed up with the grim and ghastly business of killing and being killed. A biggish battle had died out about a week before in the series of spasmodic struggles of diminishing fury that have characterized most of the battles on the Western Front, when the Tower Bridge Foot found themselves in occupation of a portion of the forward line, which was only separated from the German trench by a distance varying from forty to one hundred yards. Such close proximity usually results in an interchange of compliments between the two sides, either by speech or by medium of a board with messages written on it, the board being reserved usually for the strokes of wit most likely to sting, and therefore best worth conveying to the greatest possible number of the enemy. The towers were hardly installed in their new position when a voice came from the German parapet. Hello! Tower Bridge Foot, pleased to meet you again. The Englishmen were too accustomed to it to be surprised by this uncannily prompt recognition by the enemy of a newly relieving regiment of which they had not seen so much as a cap top. Hello, Boxy, retorted one of the towers. You're making a mistake this time. We ain't the Tower Bridges, we're the Kamchatka Islanders. Uh, you're a liar if you says you're pleased to meet us again, put in another. If you've met us afore, I uh, lay you was too dash sorry for it to want to meet us again. Oh, we know who you are, all right, replied the voice. And we know you've just relieved the fifth Blankshires. And what's more, we know who's going to relieve you, and when. He knows a bloomin' heap, said a Tower Bridge private disgustedly. And what's worse, I believe he does know it. Then, raising his voice, he asked, Do you know when we're coming to take some more of them trenches of yours? Well, this was felt by the listening towers to be a masterstroke, remembering that the British had taken and held several trenches a week before. But the reply rather took the wind out of their sails. You can't take any more, said the voice. You haven't shells enough for another attack. And uh, you had to stop the last one because your guns were running short. Anyhow, replied an English corporal who had been handing round half a dozen grenades, we ain't any way short of bombs. Have a few to be going on with. And he and his party let fly. They listened with satisfaction to the bursts, and through their trench periscopes watched the smoke and dust clouds billowing from the trench opposite. On oh, this remarked the tower private, is about our cue to exit, the stage being required for a scene shift by some Bosch bombs. And he disappeared, crawling into a dugout. During the next ten minutes, a couple of dozen bombs came over and burst in and about the British trench, and scored three casualties slightly wounded. Hi there! Where's that so old barber's assistant that thinks he can talk English? demanded the tower's spokesman cheerfully. That annoyed the English-speaking German, as of course incidentally it was meant to do. I'm here, Private Petticoat Lane, retorted the voice, and if I couldn't speak better English than you, I'd be shaming Soho. <laughs> You're doing that anyway, you bloomin' renegade dog-stealer, called back the private. Why don't you pay your landlady in London for the lodgings you owed when you run away? Schweinhund! said the voice angrily, and a bullet slapped into the parapet in front of the taunting private. 
Corporal, said that artist in invective softly, if you'll go down the trench a bit or up top or that old barn behind, I'll get this blooming Soho waiter mad enough to keep on shooting at me, and you'll perhaps get a chance to snipe him. The corporal sought an officer's permission and later a precarious perch on the broken roof of the barn, while Private Robinson extended himself in the manufacture of annoying remarks. That last one was a fair draw, Smithy, he exuded to a fellow private. I'll bet he shot the moon, did a bolt for it when he mobilized. Like enough, agreed Smithy. Go on, old man, give him some more jaw. I suppose you left without paying your washing bill either, didn't you, sauerkraut? demanded Private Robinson. There was no reply from the opposition. I expect uh, you left a lot of little unpaid bills, didn't you? If you was able to find anyone to give you a tick. I'll pay them, then we take London, said the voice. <laughs> that don't give your poor old landlady much hope, said Robinson. Take London. <laughs> Blimey, you're more like to take root in them retrenches of yours unless we comes over again and chases you out. Again there was no reply. Private Robinson shook his head. He's as hard to draw as the pay that's owed to me, he said. You have a go, Smithy. Smithy, a believer in the retort direct and no trafficker in the finer shades of sarcasm, cleared his throat and lifted up his voice. Eh, yeah, why don't you speak when you spoke to you lop-eared log of beer barrel, you? Take your face out of that horse flesh cat's meat sausage and speak up, you baby butcher and hen roost robber. Now that ain't no good, Smithy, Private Robinson pointed out. You see, calling him hard names only makes him think he's got you angry like. That he's drawed you. Another voice called something in German. Just tell them other monkeys to stop their chatter, so oh, he called out, and get back in their cage. If they want to talk to gentlemen, they must talk English. They like your damned impertinence, said the voice scornfully. We'll make you learn German, though, when we've taken England. Oh, it's England you're taking now, said Private Robinson. But all you'll have a take of England will be the same as you took before. A tuppenny tip if you serves the soup up nice, and a penny tip if you gives an Englishman a proper clean shave. The rifle opposite banged again, and the bullet slapped into the top of the parapet. <laughs> that drawed him again, chuckled Private Robinson. But I wonder why the corporal didn't get a whack at him. He pulled away a small sandbag that blocked a loophole, and holding his rifle by the butt at arm length, poked the muzzle out slowly. A moment later, two reports rang out, one in front and one behind. I got him, said the corporal three minutes later. One blunt was looking with a periscope, and I saw a little cap and one eye come over the parapet. By the way, his hands jerked up and his head jerked back when I fired. I fancy he's copped it right enough. Private Robinson got to work with a piece of chalk on a board and hoisted over the parapet a notice. R.I.P. One Bush, late lamented Soho Garçon. Pity I don't know the German for the light lamented. But they've always plenty that knows English enough to understand, he commented. He spent the next ten minutes ragging the Germans, directing his most brilliant efforts of sarcasm against made-in-Germany English speakers generally, and Soho waiters in particular, and he took the fact there was no reply from the voice as highly satisfactory evidence that it had been the Soho waiter who had copped it. Exit the waiter, curtain and soft music remarked a private known as Henry Irving throughout the battalion, and whistled a stave of, We shall meet, but we shall miss him. Come on, Henry, give us his dying speech, someone urged. And Henry proceeded to recite an impromptu dying speech of the Dush Hound Stealer, as he called it, in the most approved fashion of the East End drama, with all the accompaniment of rolling eyes, breast clutchings, and gasping pauses. Now then, where's the orchestra? He demanded when the applause had subsided, and the orchestra, one mouth organ strong, 
promptly struck up a lilting music-hall ditty. From that he slid into My Little Grey Home, with a very liberal measure of time to the long-drawn notes especially. The song was caught up and ran down the trench in full chorus. When it finished, the orchestra was just on the point of starting another tune, when Ennery held up his hand. "'He goes on Sunday to the church and sits among the choir,' he quoted solemnly and added, "'Voices heard off.' Two or three men were singing in the German trench, and as they sang, the rest joined in, and Deutschland über alles rolled forth in full strength and harmony. Bravo, and not our part, neither, said Private Robinson approvingly, though I don't know what it's all about. Now suppose we give them another. They did, and the Germans responded with the watch on the Rhine. This time Private Robinson and the rest of the towers recognized the song, and capped it in great glee with Winding Up the Watch on the Rhine, a parody which does not go out of its way to spare German feelings. And how do you like that, old sausage scoffers? demanded Private Robinson loudly. You wait, bellowed a guttural voice. Uh, us wind you up, quick. <laughs> wind up, squeak and squeakin', retorted Private Robinson. The German reply was drowned in a burst of new song, which ran like wildfire the length of the German trench. A note of fierce passion rang in the voices, and the towers sat listening in silence. "'I know what it is,' said one. "'But it sounds like they were saying something nasty, and meaning it all.' But one word, shouted fiercely and lustily, caught Private Robinson's ear. Ark, he said in eager anticipation. I do believe it. There! Triumphantly, as again the word rang out, the one word at the end of the verse, England. Hitch, hitch, hitch the M of eight. The word flew down the British trench. It's the M. They're singing the M of eight. And every man sat drinking the air in eagerly. Now, this was luck, pure gorgeous luck. Hadn't the towers, like many another regiment, heard about the famous hymn of hate and read it in the papers? and had it declaimed with a fine frenzy for Private Henry Irving. Hadn't they, like plenty other regiments, longed to hear the tune, but longed in vain, never having found one who knew it? And here it was being sung to them in full chorus by the Germans themselves. Oh, this was luck! The mouth organist was sitting with his mouth open and his head turned to listen, as if afraid to miss a single note. Have you caught it, Snapper? whispered Private Robinson anxiously at the end. Will you be able to remember it? Snapper, with his eyes fixed on vacancy, began to play the air over softly, when from further down the trench came a murmur of applause that rose to a storm of hand-clappings and shouts of bravo and encore, core, core. The mouth organist played on unheedingly, and Private Robinson sat following him with attentive ear. "'I'm not uh, sure that bit just there,' said the player, and tried it over with slight variations. "'Perhaps I'll remember it better after a day or two. I'm up that with some tunes.' "'We might kid him to sing it again,' said Robinson hopefully, as another loud cry of encore rang from the trench. "'Was you know what we have sing?' asked a German voice in tones of some wonderment. "'It's a great song, Dutchie,' replied Private Robinson. "'Fine song, good, bang. Sing it again to us.' Oh, "'You have not understand,' said the German angrily, and then suddenly from a little further along the German trench a clear tenor voice singing the hymn in English. The towers subsided into rapt silence, hugging themselves over the stupendous luck. When the singer came to the end of the verse, he paused an instant, and a roar lipped from the German trench, England. It died away, and the singer took up the solo. Quicker and quicker he sang, the song swirling upward in a rising note of passion. It checked and hung an instant on the last line, as a curling wave hangs poised. And even as the falling wave breaks thundering and rushing, so the song broke in a crash of sweeping sound along the line of the German trench with that one word, England. Before the last sound of it had passed, 
the singer had plunged into the next verse, his voice soaring and shaking with an intensity of feeling. The whole effect was inspiring, wonderful, dramatic. One felt that it was emblematic, the heart and soul of the German people poured out in music and words and the scorn, the bitter anger, hatred, and malice that vibrated again in that chorus last word might well have brought fear and trembling to the heart of an enemy. But the enemy immediately concerned, to wit His Majesty's Regiment of Tower Bridge Foot, were most obviously not impressed with fear and trembling. Impressed, they certainly were. Their applause rose in a gale of clappings and cries and shouts. They were impressed, and Private Henry Irving, clapping his hands sore and stamping his feet in the trench bottom, voiced the impression exactly. It beats Saturday night in the gallery of the old Brit, he said enthusiastically. That bloke blimey, he ought to be doing the star part of Drury Lane. And he wiped his hot hands on his trousers and fell again to beating them together, palms and fingers curved cunningly to obtain a maximum of noise from the effect. An officer passed hurriedly along the trench. If there's any firing, every man to fire over the parapet and only straight to his own front, he said. And almost at the moment there came a loud bang from out in front, followed quickly by bang, 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 in a running series of reports. The shouting had cut off instantly on the first bang. Some rifles squibbed off at intervals for a few seconds and increased suddenly to a sputtering roar. With the exception of one platoon near their centre, the towers replied rapidly to the fire. The Maxims joined in, and a minute later, with a whoop and a crash, the shells from a British battery passed over the trench and burst along the line of the German parapet. After that, the fire died away gradually, and about ten minutes later, a figure scrambled hastily over the parapet and dropped into safety, his boots squirting water his wet shirt-tails flapping about his bare, wet, and muddy legs. He was a bomb officer, who had taken advantage of the hymn of hate diversion to go crawling up a little ditch that crossed the neutral ground until he was near enough to fling into the German trench the bombs he carried. And, as he put it later in reporting to the O.C., give him something to hate about. And each evening after that, for as long as they were in the trenches, the men of the Tower Bridge Foot made a particular point of singing the Hymn of Hate, and the wild yell of England that came at the end of each verse might almost have pleased an enemy of England's instead of aggravating them intensely, as it invariably did the Germans opposite to the extent of many wasted rounds. "'It's been a great do, Schnapper said Private Henry Irving some days after, as the battalion tramped along the road towards reserve billets. And I haven't enjoyed myself so much for months. Didn't it rag em beautiful? And won't we fair stagger the house at the next sing-sing of the brigade? Snapper chuckled and breathed contentedly into his beloved mouth-organ, and first Henry and then the marching men took up the words. Ite of the art and ite of the hand, ite by water and ite by land, who do we ite to beat the band? Uh, deficient memories, it will be noticed, uh, being compensated by effective inventions in odd lines. The answering roar of England startled almost to shagging point the horse of a brigadier trotting up to the trail of the column. What on earth are those fellows singing? he asked one of his officers while soothing his mount. "'I'm not sure, sir,' said the officer, "'but I believe by the words of it, "'yes, it's the German's hymn of hate.' "'A French staff officer riding with the brigadier "'stared in astonishment, first at the marching men "'and then at the brigadier, who was rocking with laughter in his saddle. "'Where on earth did they get the tune? "'I've never heard it before,' said the brigadier, "'and tried to hum it. "'The staff officer told him something of the tale as he had heard it, and the Frenchman's amazement and the brigadier's laughter grew as the tale was told. We have one foe and one alone. England! bellowed the towers, and out of the pause that came so effectively before the last word of the verse rose a triumphant squeal from the mouth organ, and the appealing voice of Private Henry Irving, Now then, put a bit of eight into it. But even that artist of the emotions had to admit his critical sense 
of the dramatic fully satisfied by the tone of vociferous wrath and hatred flung into the tower's answering roar of England! What an extraordinary people, said the French staff officer, eyeing the brigadier shaking with laughter on his prancing charger, and he could only heave his shoulders up in an ear-embracing shrug of non-comprehension when the laughing brigadier tried to explain to him, as I explained to you in the beginning. At the best bit of the whole joke is that this particular regiment is English to the backbone. End of section 10